back one more time. Sorry about the short technical delay, but we are ready to move on ahead. Our next speaker is Dr. Kristen Russell. Dr. Russell is an assistant, she is an assistant professor of justice studies at the College of Juvenile Justice at Prairie View A&M University. She's also a research scientist in the te Texas Juvenile Justice I, now I can't talk. See, it was my eyes this morning. Now it's my tongue. At the Texas Juvenile Crime Prevention Center there. So I, my, my take on Dr. Russell after reading all her information is she's just another, she's another one of those weird people who takes an interest in us who have committed these heinous crimes sometime in the past and invested her life in discussing, helping, researching, and doing good out of all of this, for which we're most appreciative. We've heard of a from a couple of our other researchers uh, this morning, and she's another one in that same wonderful group of people who, who study and look for positive solutions for all this stuff. So we're delighted to have her with us. Um, Sorry, I got lost for a moment. Um, I have, she struck me as being one of the most well-rounded researchers that I've seen in that she's gone beyond some of the basics of sexual offending and the, the things we talk about every day in this area. And she has, has examined stigma and labeling in public and judicial perceptions of offenders and uh, sen sentencing outcomes, and as you'll see today, collateral consequences on family members and related people. So she's looked at all different elements of this puzzle. Uh, so she's published a long list of papers in professional journals, and I wouldn't even try to list them all. The list is so big. Uh, so she, she's got some pretty good credentials and uh, brings a lot to the table today. And she's just, uh, she's going to be addressing unintended consequences, the impact of sex offense registries on partners, which has been maybe a little bit of a theme here today. And that's a good one because we have a lot of folks here who are in that boat of being the partners and the family members and the people who have to shoulder all the unintended, unintended consequences. And I, I, I have just an, a note, by the way. You're not allowed to throw anything at her. <laughs> she, she knows what's coming. <laughs> she, she told her father she was coming to do this, and his response to her was, dodge the eggs, they're hard, tomatoes just go splat. <laughs> so... <laughs> let's let, let's just demonstrate to him that we're a better group than that. <laughs> Dr. Russell, welcome. Thank you all. That was a very thorough introduction. I appreciate everything. And hopefully we can prove my dad wrong. I appreciate that as well. Um, First of all, I just want to say it's been an honor to be here, to meet so many of you. Um, I hope I get to meet a lot more of you before this is over. Um, but I've already been really inspired just from one day of getting to know people here. Um, I feel more motivated than ever to do this kind of work. Um, so thank you for being willing to share your stories in these settings. Um, this is my first year at Narsal, but I hope it is the first of many. Um, and then I do want to tell you a little bit about myself. And I don't know if this is, we're going to go over here. And I also kind of use this as an excuse to show you a picture of my adorable dog. Um, but I think it's important, as some of the researchers this morning had said, to kind of give that background context of who you are, especially when you're a researcher coming in and studying a topic that maybe you don't have a personal connection to. It's important for you to understand the lens through which I understand and, and look at the things that I'm looking at um, and why I'm inspired to do this kind of work. Um, so my background is primarily all in psychology, um, but um, like Dr. Leon talked about this morning, um, with her interdisciplinary work, I also do interdisciplinary work. My PhD is in uh, interdisciplinary social psychology. 
Um, and that means I was trained by faculty members who were in criminal justice, judicial studies, psychology, sociology, communications, and health. Um, and that means that I see these kind of topics from maybe a really diverse perspective, um, and I approach them maybe with a different lens. Um, so I'm sure you'll hear a lot of things that you already know um, during my talk today, but hopefully there's a few things that maybe you didn't think about in the same way that I did. Um, and then I got the question yesterday. Um, Stuart and Joan Levy took me to dinner, which I greatly appreciated. It was one of the warmest welcomes I've had at a conference before. Um, but during that conversation, they asked, you know, why do you do this work? Like, how in the world did you get kind of started on this? Um, and it's kind of a long story, so I'll, I'll spare you from all the details, but over the years, I met some people on the registry who, in my interactions with them, I think challenged my own views, how I was raised, what I was taught about the registry, what I thought I knew about it, um, changed my perspective of who these individuals are. Um, I think that learning people's stories is really important to how you perceive things. Um, and I carried that interest into my work. Um, I wanted to go to school to be a therapist. I wanted to work in um, incarceration settings and help people. And I got into detention, juvenile detention, working with youth. And while I was there, I, I got really, I would say, discouraged um, because even though I felt like we were doing a lot to help youth, I felt like they were just up against it, right? There are so many things, policies and, and practices that we have in place that just set them up for failure, and it was frustrating. And even though I knew I couldn't go out and change the world, and I wasn't going to be the person who changes any of these policies, as you all know how difficult that is to do, um, I hoped that I could be a tiny piece of it and give you some data that you can use when you are making the arguments that you're making and you're, you're fighting that good fight of trying to get better policies implemented in our country. So I, I hope that the research I'm doing can help be informative in, in people's practices and, and hopefully someday in policy as well. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about um, my research. Specifically, um, the research I'm talking about today is research that was done as part of my doctoral dissertation. Um, so it is a massive research project. I'm only going to talk about parts of it, but it's a lot, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, but as you know today that there are over 900,000 um, people on the registry, and, and that's in your little pamphlet in your orange folders as well. But I was informed this week that these are actually outdated numbers, and the number is much closer to a million, possibly above. Um, and so I think that's really, first of all, important for you to be thinking about the scope but for me, I was thinking about the scope of, okay, if every single one of those people has multiple people that are close to them in their lives, how many people are actually impacted, right? We're talking about millions of people in our country being impacted, and that was really powerful for me. And I started thinking about the research that's been done on the collateral consequences, and I know you're all very familiar with what those are. Um, we know based on uh, anecdotal experiences and also based on the research, that people are experiencing things like increases in depression and anxiety and other mental health issues. There are barriers to housing and employment, um, experiencing uh, a lot of things related to financial issues, um, stigma and labeling, getting that kind of um, perception and shame. Um, and so there's so many negative consequences, right? And so my thought was, all of those family members, all of those partners, all of their children, what are they experiencing as well? Are they experiencing some of these same things? And as I mentioned before, I'm interdisciplinary, and there's a stigma theory, um, often referred to as a secondary stigma, but I was looking at it through a health lens, and in the health research, they often call that courtesy stigma, which I think is kind of a strange phrasing, because courtesy sounds like something polite that we give to someone to be nice. Um, so if you hear me use that phrase, I'm talking about secondary stigma. Um, and that's the idea that someone who's associated with someone who is labeled or perceived as deviant in our communities can also experience stigma. And the research that's been done on that shows us that they experience some of the same levels of social isolation, some of those same mental health declines, you know, the anxiety and depression, and also reduced overall well-being in their lives. And we see the research in a lot of different areas, but I was primarily looking at 
um, the health literature, as I had said before, so people who are associated maybe with someone who has um, an infectious disease or um, like HIV, and how they were stigmatized just because they were working with that population or because that they were um, associated with them in some way. And then in the criminal justice system, we started applying this to people who were working with um, people who have committed sex offenses. They were working with um, or looking at people who were the parents of uh, school shooters. And so this type of literature, it, it can go into a broad range of things, but I wanted to know, okay, well, what have they found specifically about this with partners and families? And there's not a ton of research, and Dr. Leon has actually done some of that research that I, I've learned about and pulled from, which is really exciting. Um, and there are studies that look at family members in general, but. I was really focused on partners. I did a lot of research on relationships while I was um, in graduate school, and so I wanted to tie that into what I work on. Um, and I really wasn't finding the answers to the questions I had. I wasn't finding the data to support the things that I thought were t going to be the case. Um, and this quote that's on here is actually a quote from one of my participants, and I, I just think it's really powerful, and I wanted to share it with you. This individual said, no one cares about the potential for severe harm to the family members of registrants. No one cares. And she, this person was not unique in her response and her thoughts about this. You know, I think a lot of the people who participated in my research were saying very similar things. That no one cares what we have to think or say or feel. They don't care that we're being harmed. Um, that was reiterated over and over again and it's heartbreaking. Um, and the further I've gotten into the research, the more I want to keep doing this line of research because I think it's really important. And these people have really wonderful ideas and very powerful voices that need to be heard. So I'm hoping to share a little bit about what I've learned from them so far, but there's lots more to come, and I hope I can share that with you in the future as well. So one of the other things that I was interested in, because as a true psychologist, I want to think about how we make things better too. And so my first thought was, well, is there anything that protects, anything that these people might already have that protects them from the negative harmful effects if they are experiencing courtesy stigma? And so I wanted to understand um, if social support mattered, if sense of coherence mattered, and sense of coherence is a psychology term, but it essentially gets at whether or not you have the perception that you can deal with kind of bad circumstances and the things that you're going through. And then also disclosure, um, you know, to the extent that which you control the disclosure, who you disclose to, all of that information, whether or not that might mitigate. So I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail today, but I, I'm not going to go too far into it, but it was important that we looked at it and, and started thinking about what might stop these negative effects on at least a small level. So. In my research, and I, I promise not to get too heavy into the statistics, um, but I do want to share a little bit of, wi of it with you because it does kind of form the foundation of my understanding. I wanted to test a model looking at courtesy stigma and how it impacts all of those negative outcomes. So you can see here in my study, I looked at how courtesy stigma impacts well-being, self-esteem, anxiety, stress, depression, social isolation, and relationship quality. And I looked to see how social support, sense of coherence, and disclosure might mitigate some of that negative impact of the stigma. And then I know it's tiny on the screen, and I apologize. I didn't know that these were relatively small. But at the bottom, it also says that there are statistical controls. And what that means is I knew that these things don't happen in a vacuum. There's all sorts of other important factors that contribute to whether or not someone experiences stigma, how much stigma, and of course, all these outcomes. You know, there's a lot of other things that affect our mental health and our well-being. And so we did our best to control for a lot of things, the demographic um, characteristics of our participants, um, their own victimization histories, their own history of whether or not they've committed any sexual offenses or on the registry themselves. Um, relationship factors, whether or not they're still with a partner, when they were with the partner, um, and also uh, offense-related characteristics, because we know that certain types of sexual offending are maybe perceived um, with more maybe shame, blame, guilt, those sorts of things, and so certain ones are going to be more stigmatized, and we wanted to recognize that and, and expect to see that in our data. So I won't bore you too much with this part, but this is essentially everything that we included in our survey. So everything that you saw 
on the previous slide was included in my survey, and I did a big online survey. Um, we did it online so it could be anonymous, so people could feel comfortable um, telling us and, and, and answering these questions about what they were going through and what their experiences were. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that well, but there's little numbers next to each one of those scales, and all that means is that these scales were working reliably. Um, we tested the reliability of all of them, and they were working well. That means that we can have some confidence in all of our conclusions that we're making because the scales were working. Um, but we asked a lot of things, and I, I suspect, because Narcel was extremely helpful in, in sharing my survey, that there might be people in this room who participated in my research, and if you were, I apologize that I put you through like a 30-minute survey, um, but I'm so appreciative of everyone that took the time to answer all of these questions because it allowed us to look at a lot of different things. Before I tell you what we found, I do want to tell you about a challenge that researchers experience in this area. So we have something that we call hard to reach participants, and a lot of times we see this in criminal justice research or among stigmatized groups. Um, and it makes it really difficult for us to reach people and get data if they're suspicious of researchers, if um, you know, they're just in general hard to reach, maybe we don't have some, you know, I didn't have a listserv of everyone who was eligible to participate in this kind of research. I had to really get out there and try to find people who might be eligible. And it can be really challenging to reach these people. And so um, we obviously did the online survey, hoping to reach the most amount of people as possible, but gatekeepers um, or people who have connections to the community, that was really the most important thing. So for our research, we reached out to first all 50 states. I reached out to probation and parole. I reached out to the Department of Corrections. I reached out to treatment providers. I reached out to the registry offices. And nobody helped me. <laughs> and I'm sure that's not surprising to any of you. <laughs> But it was, I was just dumbfounded because they're the people who have the direct connection with that community and could, could pass it on and I just couldn't believe that they wouldn't even give the link out. That's all I wanted. Can you share this link? Share this with the people that you work with and maybe they can share it with their partners. We sent out, I sent out hundreds of emails and I got no respondents, which tells me that nobody passed it along, right? So then I went to the next phase of my study, which was I'm really annoying on social media. And some of you know that <laughs> because I know that you know about my dad because of social media. So I was like, I'm going to use social media. I'm going to bother everyone, everyone that I know, and reach out to those connections. And in doing so, I found out about all these organizations, right? People were tagging me on Twitter. They're like, hey, do you know about Narsol? Do you know about Women Against the Registry? They started giving me all these connections. And so it was reaching out to people who provide housing for uh, registrants and their families. It was reaching out to people who work directly with this community, having organizations like NARSOL and the others post it on their newsletters, send it out to you in emails. We ended up reaching a lot of people. And when I proposed this, somebody asked me earlier, um, how my, t my research is perceived in academia. And I know that you understand these challenges as well, Dr. Leon. Um, I was told if I wanted a job to maybe research something else. Um, obviously, I didn't listen. <laughs> um, I'm only two years into my career, so I hope it continues and, and all of that, but I, I kind of went against the recommendations because I think this is so important. And when I went in front of my dissertation committee and proposed this project, they were like, no way. You're not even going to get these people to participate. They're not going to want to talk to you. And thanks to these organizations like NARSAL, and I know I'm going to keep saying it, but like, you're the reason. Everyone in this room who shared my link on social media or passed it along to people they know or put it on listservs, you're the reason why I was able to complete this research and get my PhD, so I am forever grateful. Um, but I ended up getting, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I ended up getting a lot of participants, and, and my dissertation committee said, I hope you get at least 25. Like, we'll be okay if you get 25, because at least you can make some. Well, I got, I think, like 380 total um, participated, so um, 
they, they really were impressed, so I appreciate everybody. So before I get into that data, um, there is a publication up here, and if you, if you want any of my publications, because they probably are behind a paywall, I'm happy to send them to you. Um, my email address is at the end of um, my presentation, but we wrote a paper in health communication where we talk about that methodology that I took, um, that approach to the survey, and what the challenges of, of getting gatekeepers to actually buy into your research and share it with the communities, because if you don't have a direct connection to the community, it's really hard to reach people. So we wrote this paper, hopefully encouraging other academics to, to reach out to these populations as well, because it's worth doing the research. Um, and I know a lot of times they can be deterred um, if they're not part of a community. So we hope um, that it inspires a few people to get out there and, and you know, take untraditional routes to get their data. Um, so if you want access to this, just let me know. So although we had over 300 some participants, we had 297 people who provided all of the responses. So I said it was a massive survey. So we had 297 that we could look at their complete data. So those are the ones we included in our models and, and all of the statistics. We ended up reaching people from over 40 states, which was really exciting for me. But you know how many people are registered in a lot of these states. So you know this is a very small amount of people who are affected by the issue. Um, on average, our participants were 45 years old. They were white females. 69% um, of them were parents. 87.9% said that they were heterosexual. And 4.7 of the respondents were also registered themselves. And that's something we had to take into consideration because they were probably experiencing both primary and secondary stigma. We asked them about their relationship um, to the person who was on the registry. So 62% of them said that they were currently living with their partner, 70% were married. So what that tells you is that we have a, kind of a big chunk of people who are married but not living with their partners. Um, and we heard that a lot in their responses to explanations of it just made sense um, to live apart given that the things that we were going through and experiencing. So that was really interesting. We also had people who were um, participating in our research who weren't with their partner anymore, but they still wanted to share their experiences. Um, and I'm not going to get into it today because we haven't analyzed all the data yet, but we did get responses from them about all of the contributing factors of the dissolution of that relationship. And I think that's going to be really interesting to see what, what the difference is between the people who stay versus the people who, who chose to leave. Um, and additionally, we looked at three kind of aspects of the relationship, right? I was really interested, um, I mentioned before, um, blame, shame, and guilt. So when we're talking about stigma, we're typ typically talking about blame, shame, and guilt. Now, shame is really broad, and it's something you can experience just because you're associated with something. But blame and guilt are a little different. So blame is typically from other people, and it's typically about you should have done something maybe to stop what happened. You should have known that it was happening. So it's people assuming that you could have, could have done something. And then there's that guilt. So maybe there's that guilt of I should have known or guilt of I should have done something or, or you know, those same kind of things, but it's internal as, as opposed to external. Well, I think that's going to be different depending on whether or not you were with someone when it actually happened versus when it didn't. And so what we looked at, we looked at whether or not the individuals were together at the time of the offense and the time that the registration took place, meaning that they were with the person before the registry um, or the registration happened. We also captured the people who entered into the relationship with someone. They knew they were on the registry and, and they were aware of it, but they still entered into the relationship. And then we also had 11% of people who entered into a relationship with someone who was on the registry already, but they didn't know that they were on the registry. So that's something that either someone told them later on, they found out from someone else, or eventually their partner disclosed that information to them. But we suspect these people will experience stigma differently, so we wanted to capture that. And then just if you're curious about their partners, um, the average age was 45. Um, the average age at their initial registration was around 36 years old. And they were primarily white males, and 93% of them were still on the registry. All right, so nothing on this slide is going to be surprising to you. Um, but when we asked about courtesy stigma, we looked at some correlations with all of those outcome variables I talked about. And we found that greater levels of internalized courtesy stigma 
were associated with an increase in anxiety, stress, depression, and social isolation, and a decrease in well-being, self-esteem, and relationship quality. So every single thing that we thought might be true was true. Um, and so that was, again, not surprising, but now we have data to support it. And I think that's the, the gap that was missing in the literature. Um, there were some really good studies on family members, um, but a lot of them are qualitative, and I was like, we need some quantitative data to say, no, 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 here's some of the evidence, here's some of the data to support that this really is going on. Um, and so I hope this is kind of helping us paint the picture and people to understand what's going on. Um, and then additionally, uh, we found that people do experience courtesy stigma differently depending on when they entered that relationship with their partner. So um, people who were with their partner um, at the time that the offense took place and the registration happened were experiencing courtesy stigma at a much higher level. And again, that's probably because that the, the factors of blame and guilt play a role more with someone who was present when things were happening versus someone who entered into a relationship. And we heard this actually in some of the open-ended items. You know, it's like, well, I entered into a relationship with this person after those things happened. They're a different person now. And so I think they were able to mitigate a little bit of that stigma because of that. And then additionally, on average, every single person was experiencing negative outcomes. Um, but those who were with their partner uh, when the registration occurred um, had significantly increased social isolation and significantly reduced relationship quality. And when we're talking about relationship quality, we are talking about with the registrant. So the offense and the registrant obviously put a very big strain on the relationships of a lot of these people, and they talked about that um, in the study as well. And then I mentioned before, I wanted to kind of see if there's anything that mitigates this, right? Is there anything in your life that kind of helps you deal with the courtesy stigma that you're experiencing. And, and we looked at social support, sense of coherence, and disclosure. And what we found that it, it does buffer a little bit, um, but not against all negative outcomes. And to be honest, the statistical effects were not powerful, meaning that if I'm being honest, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this with confidence, that these things are truly helping um, in any way. And what that tells us is courtesy stigma is much more salient than these other maybe positive things in these people's lives that so they can't defend against that really negative um, experience of the stigma. It's very powerful. Um, and then, of course, I, I have more specific data on all of this. So if anyone is curious, again, I'm happy to provide it. We're working on a publication with this quantitative data right now, um, but it is published in my dissertation, so I'm happy to provide anyone with this if they're curious. So that brings me to the what is important, right? What's important from these findings and, and why does all of this matter? So I think one of the things that's really important is that not only do registered, um, partners of registered citizens experience courtesy stigma, but they're also greatly affected by it. Um, and I think that just highlights the fact that we can't ignore all of the secondary consequences, those secondary registrants, as, as I've been hearing them called a lot. And, it, I think it just really highlights the need for us to understand the impact that stigma and policies are having on, on partners and families. Um, and obviously, I know many of you have already talked about this, so it's not surprising to you, but I think it's important that we have empirical evidence. Um, I have the opportunity in my role to talk to legislators sometimes, um, not about this topic typically because I work on juvenile crime. Um, but I've talked to policymakers um, a little bit about this, and, and the thing I always hear from them is show us the data. You know, they, they say show us the data. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about the discrepancy with that, but now I've got it, right? So I've got the, I've got the receipts to back up what I'm saying, and I think that's important. And also, we've identified a few things that might slightly buffer against these negative effects, but they are not sufficient they are absolutely not enough to buffer against these negative things. And why should policymakers care? So that's the other important thing, and, and something that I think is really important in the conversations that are going on throughout this conference in general, and, and I'm, I'm learning a lot, um, because a lot of you have way more experience than I do in this arena. Um, but I think if you are having a conversation with someone, a policymaker, at the end of the day, right, they should be caring about community safety. 
they should be caring about reducing sexual offending and sexual harm. And one way that we do that is reducing recidivism. Well, partners play an extremely critical role in successful reentry, in supporting their partners. If they are experiencing all of the same negative effects, how can they adequately do that? How can they be that supportive partner that helps their um, you know, partner re-enter society and, and help them with rehabilitation? If they're experiencing all the ne same negative stigma and same negative effects, and I think that's something important to talk about because, again, these are people who shouldn't be affected by the registry, but they are. And not only are they affected, but they're not even able to help the people who are on the registry. Um, and if we want to improve recidivism, we have to think about how to support partners and family members as well. Um, it needs to be part of the conversation. So another part of my research um, and, and, and I, I really love qualitative research, but I, I wanted to do a mixed method study. So if you know anything about research, quantitative is all the numbers and all the statistical tests, and then qualitative is things like interviews and, and allowing people to openly talk about what they're experiencing. And that qualitative research gives us really robust information and helps us learn things that we wouldn't know to ask. I mentioned before, I have only been working in my role for a couple years. Um, I've had experience working in the juvenile justice system and, and such for almost a decade now. Um, but um, I only know what I know. You know, I only have the knowledge that I know and, and being in places like this and getting to talk to many of you um, is already teaching me a lot that I didn't know and I'm going to approach my research differently just from what I've learned here. Um, but I wanted to include some opportunity for people to really share in my survey to, to get some qualitative data. And while we didn't get much because they're just survey questions and people were probably very tired of answering my questions, but I was shocked that people literally took the time to write paragraphs in response to some of my questions. So I'm gonna go over three of those today, but I actually have a lot more and I hope to share it with you in the future. The first question I asked, was if you had the opportunity to speak with a policymaker, what would you tell them? What is it important for them to know? I also asked, what is the worst thing that has happened to you as a result of your partner being on a registry? And I thought that was an important question because what if I miss things? Again, I only know what I know. I only know what I've learned from the research. I only know what I've learned from my you know, few conversations with people who are affected by the registry. So I'm sure there's things I'm missing. Um, I learned about a lot of things. I learned about um, you know, an individual who was talking about they're not even allowed to give candy out on Halloween. I didn't know that. Um, there are aspects to this that I don't know anything about. Um, so I gave that open opportunity and I learned a lot. And this question might strike you as weird. <laughs> But I also said, what's the best thing that's happened to you? And that was my little, little bit of optimism of hoping that there was some good. Um, but also in research, we always try to be, see things from all aspects and all sides. And we, if I only ask about the negative, I'll only know about the negative. So I decided to put this in here. So I have published that first question. So if you're interested in the really nuanced findings that we have, Happy to share this with you. It is, it is open access. It's on qualitative criminology. So if you look it up, you should be able to find it free. Um, but we looked at what everyone would say to policymakers. And as you can see here, um, the title is Shame and Justice. Partners of Individuals on Sex Offense Registries Encourage Policy Reform. So they had a lot to say. And I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. So there are three kind of main themes that came out in their responses. The first one is registry issues. They talked about the fact that this is a one-size-fits-all solution to a very diverse group of people, very diverse offenses, very diverse circumstances, and this is not an appropriate way to handle this. And they talk about how it's ineffective, um, and a lot of people were giving data, like they were literally citing things in their survey response, like they were telling me which sources to go to. And that first of all taught me how educated 
people are on this topic because they have to be. They're, it's a necessity for them to be able to have these conversations. And that's both heartbreaking but also really encouraging because it means that they can have really strong, powerful conversations because they know the data. They know what the research actually shows. They know that the registry isn't actually effective in doing what it's supposed to do or what we say it's supposed to do. Um, they talk about how it's further punishment. A lot of people said, my partner did their time. They were sentenced to prison time and probation. They did that. They served their time. We don't treat any other type of people like this. There are no other offending groups that we punish for the rest of their lives. And I heard that over and over again. Um, I also heard a lot of people talk about low reoffending rates, which I think is a really important part of the conversation that so many people who commit sex offenses are, are first time offenders. So this isn't capturing the group that they're trying to, to capture. It's not helping with the thing that they're trying to help with. Um, so they're like, first of all, the policymakers need to know what all the issues with the registries are. And then the second thing they need to know is all of the negative consequences. So these are some of the things that I've already been talking about, but the main things they talked about were stigma, housing, the experience of social isolation, and one that came out that I did not ask many questions about because, again, I only knew what I knew, and I didn't think to ask a lot of questions about parenting. Um, and I will definitely be doing that in the future because this is something that came up so much in anyone who had children. Um, or other like children living in their families, even if it wasn't their direct children. Um, they talk about how their parents can't, or their, their partners can't really parent effectively or the same way that they would or same way as any other parent would. They talk about how they're not allowed to go to their kids' school events and how they think that affects their children. So again, even though I didn't measure um, children's perceptions of these things, we know just from the parents' kind of responses that this is probably very greatly affecting the children as well. Um, so the, the other thing they wanted to say is to the policymakers was look at all the negative consequences that this is causing to people who aren't even registered. That was the key thing. A lot of these individuals, when they were answering this question, didn't even talk about the unintended consequences for the registrants. They were like, hey, look, look beyond that and look at all the other people who are affected too, and I think that's important. And then as you can see, there's a whole bunch here. So everyone had suggestions on what we could do better. And now, as a researcher, we're always tempted to like come up and tell you what we think would, would solve the issue. Um, but I think I'm going to communicate to you what everyone in my study thinks would be the best solution. Most of the people who answered this question said get rid of registries. 100% registries are not effective, get rid of them. But then a lot of other people seem to acknowledge the fact that that's going to be very difficult and has been very difficult to even challenge. And so they proposed some other things. So they said, if, if that's never going to be a possibility, here's what we think would be the best solutions. So this is what they said. And, and this is obviously summarizing. But these, these are the main things. There were a lot of other things as well. But um, a lot of people suggested that it's limited to law enforcement only, saying that the public has no reason to have this information. Um, they talk about considering context, everybody on an individualized basis, because every situation and scenario is greatly different. Every person is different, and, and they shouldn't be lumped together in this way. Um, they talk about length requirements. Um, some people even suggested that we revisit these. So instead of someone being assigned to maybe 15 years on the registry, maybe it's up to 15 years, but that they can be reviewed every single year and perhaps there be some sort of appeals process that they could be removed from the registry. And they made that argument for people who are given a lifetime registration as well. They said, okay, but there should be some sort of process to fight it, because right now there's not a process and we feel helpless. Um, this is where I said there was that little bit of a contradiction. They said, hey, policymakers, use the data. And I said before, when I talk to policymakers, they say, show us the data. <laughs> But, but it's very clear that there's a disconnect, that there's, we have some of this data, right? We have the data that shows that we could be doing better um, and that this isn't working, but the policymakers aren't using that data, and that's a problem. Um, and then a lot of them talk about um, 
you know, maybe it should be reserved for only very severe cases. People, they called, I had several people say the worst of the worst. Um, people who are committing continued offenses, that sort of thing. Maybe only they should be on the registry, but with all these other considerations. So that's some, some of their perceptions as well. And then obviously a lot of people also thought, give them a second chance. We give everyone else a second chance. We give everyone else a chance to rehabilitate. Why not these individuals? Especially what we know about rehabilitation and, and reoffending rates. Um, so I think this was really powerful, um, but also I will say that a lot of my participants sounded very defeated in their responses. And, and just from hearing conversations since I've been here today, I, I totally hear it um, and I get it. And I'm just, I really want to commend anyone who's doing this work because it sounds very challenging and it sounds very defeating and, and I'm just so impressed by the people who are powering through that and continuing to fight that fight. Um, and then I really just briefly want to go over my other two questions that I told you that I asked. So I asked, what is the worst thing that has happened to you as a result of your partner's registration? Most people said employment and what was really interesting to me and something that I didn't expect is that there were quite a few people who said that they lost their own employment. Not the partner, not the person on the registry. They lost their employment. And I got stories from people about how their employees fired them, but like basically blamed it on something else, but they knew that it was because of their connection to the registry. I know there was one person who said she was a school teacher. And as soon as her partner became a registrant, she just suddenly lost her contract. And she tried to fight it, and she lost. And I heard so many stories like that. And, and, and it's, to me, that was unexpected. And I know anyone who's going through these situations, that probably wasn't unexpected to you. But as an outsider looking in, that was just wild to me that that, that was even possible, that that's something that can happen, and it's heartbreaking. And then a lot of people talked about the housing restrictions and how they're so affected, their kids are affected by the housing restrictions. I mentioned earlier that 70% of my participants were married, but only like 60% even lived together. And, and some of those people that were living together, by the way, were just partners too. They weren't even all the married individuals. I think um, over 10% of the married couples were not living under the same roof. And the housing restrictions was, was a big part of that. When they were explaining why that they weren't living with their partners, it's because either they live in communities where there literally is not a single place for their partner to live, so they had to leave. Or they bought a home together, they've been living in it for 20 years, and now their partner's not allowed to be there anymore, but their kids are in school, or um, you know they, they weren't ready to leave their home, and it made more sense to live in separate places. Um, and also, as, as many of you know, a lot of the places that are not restricted for registrants to live might not be in the best communities. And so some people weren't prepared to pack up their kids and move to a community that they viewed as being less safe when they could stay where they were and, and find a way to make it work with their partner living under different roofs. And as you can imagine, I told you before, we saw a reduced relationship quality in these individuals and, and I suspect living in separate places is, is probably very impactful on the relationship. Um, so that's something I'm really interested in, in talking to people about more in the future. And then social support loss was another really big thing. They said, when this happened, everyone around me disappeared. And that was, that was exact words from one of my participants. Everyone around me disappeared. And they weren't just talking about their friends or maybe the people that they work with. They were talking about their immediate family members. There were people who said, my kids left and they don't talk to me anymore. Or, you know, my siblings don't talk to me or my parents won't have anything to do with us. So again, these individuals not only are experiencing all of those things, but they're experiencing some extremely detrimental things to their livelihood, their well-being, their mental health. And that makes it really difficult for them to support the registered citizen in successful reentry, and I think that's important. Okay, so I told you I asked them what's the best thing, and I did get someone cuss at me <laughs> and basically say how dare I ask such a terrible question because clearly I know nothing, and 
I don't disagree with them. I think this question was a little insensitive depending on what you were dealing with. And so I do want to acknowledge that. That's a tough question to ask someone who is, is sitting there recounting all of these negative things to me and then be like, okay, so what, what's a good thing then? Um, we did have quite a few people say nothing, which was not surprising. But actually, the larger percent of people said something positive. Um, and that was surprising to me. And it was really powerful to hear what was, was the best thing that came out of the situation for them. And one thing that I heard a lot, so I talked about that reduced relationship quality, but there are some people who, thinks that, who think that their relationship has improved. And not improved as a result, obviously, of the registry or the offense that took place, but they've had to face something together. They've had to go through something. They've had to be there for each other in a way that other couples don't have to. And so a lot of people found that to be very powerful. It's like we face this giant storm together. We are there for each other. We, we have grown stronger together. And I thought that was really powerful because I did not expect people to tell me, like, oh, my relationship got better. Um, but there were quite a few people who really said that. They said, you know, I would, I would obviously take all of this away if I could. But I, I have to say, I don't know if we would have ever been this close. And I think that's, that's an important thing as well. And then, and I think a lot of the people in this room can probably relate to this, a lot of people said advocacy work. They had to learn so much information, and they became infuriated by everything they learned about the registries, which isn't surprising. <laughs> And then they did something about it. They're figuring out how to take action because they want to make things better for other people. So a lot of it isn't just their own situations. It sounds like people were very motivated to make sure that this, the, you know, these negative consequences don't continue happening to other families, to other people, and, and we want to improve the situation for everyone. Um, and there were people who, who really feel called to be part of these groups and, and to do this hard, hard work, and I had some people who told me that they, um, you know, are, are working on their therapy licenses because they want to be able to help people, um, and other people who went into, like, other areas of, of, of work so they can work with populations of, of individuals affected by the registries. Um, so even though, again, a lot of them said, if I could take all of this away, I would, but I'm grateful for it you know, kind of leading me to a calling, something I've become really passionate about and, and, and being able to work in. And then the last one is social relationships. And again, I think that a lot of you have friends in this room that you met through NARSOL or other organizations. And a lot of people talked about that. They say, I have lifelong friends that it's unfortunate that we had to meet, you know? <laughs> like, if I, if I could have chose not to meet these people, I would have. But I'm so glad they're in my life. I'm so glad that I made these connections. I have a community of people who understand. Now, there were also people in my study who obviously don't have this community, and I hope that you can reach those people someday. Um, but there were a lot of those who felt very isolated and didn't know that there were groups like this available to them. So very important, um, I think, kind of perspective of, of kind of how people are handling this situation and, and what they're going through and seeing a teeny bit of light in what they're experiencing. So obviously, as a scholar and researcher, we always care about theoretical and research implications. But I think the key thing and the most important thing is that we have data. Um, and, and the work that Dr. Leon, sorry to keep <laughs> pointing you out, but the work that you're doing is incredible. Um, and it's just so great to have people doing this research. And I hope that as a community, um, as people who are leaders in this area, that you seek out the help of researchers. Um, and that when researchers come to you, be suspicious. I think that's fair. Um, I had people question me. I actually had uh, my boss tell me that I was going to have to get a new phone for my work because so many people called. Um, but people are suspicious of, of what your intentions are. If you say, hey, I want to I learn about people related to the registry, they're going to automatically assume that your intentions aren't good. And that's perhaps a, a, a safe amount of suspicion. But be open, please, to hearing what we have to say because there are a lot of people that are trying to do this kind of work who are very passionate and want to help people. And uh, I think researchers connecting with this community is really important because collaborative relationships are important. And us working together, I think, is, is something that needs to happen. And so I do want to encourage you all, if you have the opportunity, to kind of engage in that. Um, 
And additionally, I just think it kind of further highlights some of the issues that are taking place and some of those collateral consequences, and that's, that's something we needed the data for so we could really support it. Um, and then just to wrap up, I talked about partners as being such important. You know, you play such an important role in the lives of um, the person who is on the registry, but also helping them successfully re-enter, being there for them in what they're going through and the, the stigma and what they're experiencing, um, and being able to hopefully promote successful reintegration. Um, if we're not providing support to the families and partners, they're not going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to work in that capacity. And so um, a lot of what we took from this and a lot of what the partners had suggested was we need more resources. A lot of people said, hey, there are so many therapeutic things out there for people on the registry, but I don't know a single therapist who only works with family members of people who are on the registry. They said, we get stuff about resources all the time, you know, where we can access this or that, but we get nothing for our children, for our partners. And perhaps that's different in different jurisdictions and different states. And, and you know, I, I, I'm hopeful to think that maybe there's an area who's, who's doing a really good job, but based on the no's that I just got when I looked around, I'm gonna assume that's not the case. So I think it's really important that we consider this as a group of individuals who also need support. And I think communities like this are communities that can maybe help bridge that gap that's taking place and, and reach these individuals. Um, and, and you know, some of them said, I don't know if there aren't resources, I just don't know where to find them. And I think that there were even some people who said, like, there's no communities, there's, there's nobody working on this. And of course, after they participated in our survey, if we still had access to their information, we can kind of send them a little email that says, hey, here's all the resources we know about. Um, so we give them the names of the organizations and things. Um, anyone who signed up, at the end of our study, they could type in their email for further information or to participate in future research um, in like a separate form so it's not linked to their responses, so their responses are still anonymous. But it gave us an opportunity to send those lists of resources. So if there were people who said, that they didn't have access, we hope that they now know that there are some resources out there for them. But we really strongly believe that there needs to be more on this. And then obviously, I hope, even if it's a little sliver of the pie, that this type of research that we're doing can help in the conversations around policy reform. And that is all I have for, for you today. I really appreciate you all taking the time to listen to me. Um, tomorrow, I will be talking about a lot of my research in, in juvenile sex offending. I know um, you had mentioned earlier, I looked at like uh, judicial perceptions of, of juveniles who commit sex offenses, so we're going to talk about that tomorrow. So if you're coming to that, I'm excited to share that work with you. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. My email address is on here, so if you're not comfortable asking here, I'm, I'm happy to answer you over email as well. Thank you. Yes. Do you think the media has done a very good job of providing the public knowledge of collateral consequences? Not at all. I think they've done a terrible job. Um, we were actually talking about this last night when we were at dinner that I did a research study, um, it was actually part of my thesis, where I looked at whether or not we could change people's perceptions by giving them some of that information. So we had two groups and it was like experimental and the one group, we gave them an entire thing to read about all of the negative things about the registry. So not only how ineffective it is, but all of the negative collateral consequences. And we had a few hundred people participate in this study. And even after reading that, they still fully supported the registry. Um, so I think it's gonna take a lot more, even if the media is mentioning it, it's not gonna be sufficient. Um, I think there's, there's gotta be a lot more going into to educating people. And somebody talked about documentaries earlier, and, and um, I think that's a powerful way. Somebody mentioned Netflix, and I, I was thinking, absolutely. Because a lot of times, we don't know what we don't know, and, and we have to be moved. And people sharing their stories, and I know I was talking to, to David earlier, um, I think yesterday, about, you know, I think it's important to have speakers at our universities, coming in and talking to people who are going to be you know, working in the field someday um, and, and doing panels and just, just 
putting a face, and, and unfortunately that means people are being forced to disclose their stories, but for the people who are comfortable doing so, I think it can be really powerful. But I hope the media gets involved with that. Uh, Dr. Russell, these questions are from the, our online audience. Okay. Uh, from Sandy, you said disclosure can help mitigate some of the negativity, and I agree, but, there are, but are they also ruining the risk of making it worse? Absolutely. So we actually had people talk about that and how there are different layers to disclosure. So who you disclose to and why you disclose is important. So in some cases people disclose but it wasn't by choice. It was kind of because they were in a situation where they had no option but to disclose. Um, and also, and I'll skip back to it really quick because I know it's really hard to see on this screen here. But disclosure in our models only buffered against negative effects on self-esteem and depression. So only on two things. So it, it really was not effective, and it probably is because disclosure is such a complex thing. All right, and the second question from Jeff. Could trauma healing be impaired by the registry? You stated that healthy relationships are impeded by the stigmas that are shared. Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris and colleagues have found that healthy relationships are one of the several avenues of, that support a trauma-informed mental health aspect. Assuming the prevalence of trauma is also high among those convicted of a sexual crime and also the prevalence of generational trauma, is it just another way of the registry is raising recidivism and generational offending? Yeah, so there was a lot in that question, um, but that's a really important question and I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep my response short too. So. I recently did a study, and I'm going to talk about it tomorrow, where we actually asked people who are working, you know, therapy kind of settings about their thoughts on the registry and how it's impacting. And you could tell those individuals that really cared and wanted to make a difference felt defeated because, again, they're up against what the, what the effects of the registry are. Um, and, you know, when I said I worked in detention and, and a lot of those people, you know, that we were working with in treatment setting were coming in with their own traumas and a lot of their things. And it's hard to work through all of that when there's all of these external negative things going on. It's almost making a barrier where you can only make so much progress, unfortunately. And I, I think it's a really important thing that needs to be discussed, especially in the discussion around therapy and rehabilitation. Yes. Let's see if this works. Uh, could I get your comment on the um research of Richard Wallert at the University of Vancouver. Are you familiar with I'm that? I'm not familiar. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Well, when I was in prison, I saw somebody else had a, a copy of some congressional testimony by him. Um, and so I wrote him, and he's a very nice guy, and he sent me one of his uh, textbook chapters with a little note saying, wouldn't want you to get below the 0.05. So he's a little bit more uh, qualitative than yeah. you to be able to tell that joke. But he has quite a lot of good research, and I would recommend him okay. very I'll much. I'll definitely look into him, because I'm, I'm not sure I'm familiar. Yeah, Richard Wallert at the University of Vancouver. It's on this side of the border. Okay. But it's called the University of Vancouver. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, hello, Dr. Russell. Uh, my name is Leon Zaltel. I'm a current uh, registrant. Um, the thing I wanted to ask about was your part about um, the show me the data. Um, so definitely what I see is that when it comes to people who are um, uh, so advocates for the people on the registry, there seems to be a lot more uh, stringent requirements of show me the data. Mm -hmm. um, but there was something recently in the news where there was a, a unanimous decision to change residency uh, restrictions from 1,000 feet away from child safety zones to uh, 2,500 safety zones, uh, 2,500 feet. Wow. And the reasoning, they said, was because they wanted to keep things uh, consistent to avoid uh, sex offenders migrating to their area. So um, from what you were saying about like um, family support structures, it seems like people try to make things work in the places where they already are. Yeah. Have you ever encountered this Migra alleged migratory behavior of sex offenders? I mean, I mean yes. Um, 
unfortunately, and it's something that a lot of people, and I, I hate that terminology because I mean, it almost sounds voluntary and it's not. Like they're literally being forced to move. Um, but we did, you know, in, in the participants that I've spoken with and, and in my other research as well, that seems to be a really big theme, especially in certain states. Um, it seems like certain states, and, and especially if they live in like a city, um, where they're forced to move to a new place. And, and I've also noticed that some people have moved to other states. Um, some of the people in my research study talked about moving to another state voluntarily. It wasn't like they were forced from their homes, but they wanted to move to a state where they would be treated differently um, with the perception that maybe some states have like lessened restrictions. Um, so I think that's really interesting. I mean, I haven't looked at it specifically, but I know it comes up even in my data. Thank you. I think this is still on. Yes. Uh, I wanted to just add a, uh, you, again, you were talking about the show me the data. And uh, just to share an encouragement, uh, suggestion for people who are testifying regularly, uh, that they don't know about the collateral consequences. The, a part of the assumption of people, uh, legislators, et cetera, um, you know, they, they go with the stereotype. Everybody on the registry must be the person that jumped out of the bush, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So when you are testifying wherever you can or when you're talking to legislators or others, it, it is extremely helpful to point out your data there about how many of them are parents with children. I, 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 I did an interview and you know, this happened at one point where I, I said, you know, these people have kids and they can't go visit their kids at the school. And they go, they have what? I mean, you know, they are just shocked. And I think the more we share that kind of information, I think that will, again, help humanize and help expand beyond this hated class to point out that there's this whole host of collateral consequences. So I just wanted to add yeah. that, because you're absolutely right. That's really, I just want to say, too, if um, there's data that you're interested in, so like the data that I shared with you today, if you need that in like a short form, you need a paragraph where I just highlight all that, just email me. I know that a lot of researchers feel the same way. If you're going to testify, if you're writing a report, and you need like, my, my dissertation, this research is 200 pages long, right? I don't expect anyone to read through all of that. I hope that no one ever has. Um, that would be torture. I haven't even read it through, I don't think. Um, so I, I hope that like if there is data that you learn about in conferences like these that you, you think would be powerful and, and be a good part of whatever it is that you're trying to, to say, don't be afraid to reach out because I think that we are more than happy to share that um, in whatever format you need it in. Hi, Dr. Russell. Um, I had a question about um, did you hear from respondents, and you touched on it a little bit, about the parenting issue? And I know that I find in my own experience, sometimes you feel caught between um, doing what's best for your children and doing what's best for your partner. Yeah. And you don't know like which one to juggle. Did you hear some of that from your respondents? We absolutely did. I actually, I hope in the future that I can do um, interviews primarily with registrants who also are um, partners of registrants who have children um, because of how often it came up. Um, and it sounded like there were a lot of challenges navigated, but that was definitely one of them because in a lot of situations, um, for example, I talked about people having to live in separate homes. That, that conversation specifically is navigating what's best for the individual on the registry versus what's best for the family and in some cases they choose to leave because I think it'll be better for the kids um, and that may not necessarily be true right we know what living in a single parent parent family what kind of impact that can have on a child and so so separating the family might not be the best solution but in some cases maybe it is I think it just depends on each individual um, situation and I, I from what I gather from, from the responses that I got that's extremely complex and every single person's dealing with those challenges and how to navigate that, and I don't think they have, I, from from what it sounded like, they they don't know the right answer either, um, and that was just one of many of the parenting kind of challenges that they were facing, um, and I, I think it's, I think it's really critical that we understand it more and look into it more so we can better support families. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Anybody else? Okay. Thank you.